welcome. Welcome to our audience here um, in London. We've got the lovely view of the Thames behind us. And I know this is being watched all over the world. So um, welcome to you wherever you are tuning in from. It's um, a very great honor to be here today. Uh, my name's Stephanie Merritt. I write as SJ Paris, and I'm here with not one, but two titans of uh, English storytelling. Um, so it's, it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce both of them to you. I think between them, they have written well over 100 books and probably sold more copies than the Bible. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's really um, wonderful to get them in the same room. Bernard Cornwall has worked as a teacher and a current affairs producer before turning to his enormously successful writing career. He's the author of several uh, much-loved series, including the Last Kingdom series, the Grail Quest series, the Starbuck series, and of course, uh, our beloved Sharp. And his new book, uh, Sharp's Assassin, is a return to, to the Sharp novels, so we'll be talking about that a little bit as well. Geoffrey Archer, Lord Archer, is uh, a former politician, um, as I'm sure you all know, and the author of um, many, many standalone novels, and also his recent successful series include the Clifton Chronicles, and the William Warwick novels, of which the new one, Over My Dead Body, is the fourth in the series. So um, welcome to both of you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for being here. And um, I want to start by asking, uh, obviously, we've got these two fabulous new books to look forward to. So um, the last year, I, I can guess that neither of you have suffered terribly with writer's block over the last year. but. How has the last year or year and a half of what's been going on in the world and being perhaps shut away, uh, cut off from your normal kind of pursuits, how has that affected your creative process or, or has it not? I don't think it has. I mean, I've always said that writing is a solitary vice. And I mean, for me, it just felt normal. I just sort of go off to the office, take the dog, sit down and work and try not to play too much solitaire. <laughs> That's about it. It really did feel quite normal. And it was much worse for my wife, who's a very sociable being, and she felt trapped. But I didn't really notice that much difference. Yeah. I felt very, it's very interesting you mentioned your wife. My wife had to close the Science Museum, open the Science Museum, close the Science Museum, open the Science Museum, and had a dreadful 14 months. Whereas, and I, had a, I have a friend who owns a restaurant, dreadful 14 months. I have a friend who owns an art gallery, dreadful 14 months. And I almost felt guilty by the fact that you, w we're locked in, Bernard, and we're in lockdown, but what's to stop you picking up a pen? And as you say, just carrying on. Carrying on as normal, yeah. It was much worse for Judy, because she's very sociable. And she missed her church. And I didn't get, don't go to church, so it didn't worry me. Um, <laughs> But in terms of um, doing events and promotions and touring and meeting readers and all the things that are part of a, a successful author's life, obviously all of that shut down. Did that actually leave you more time for work? Did well you find you were more productive? Every cloud has a silver lining, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and no, I didn't miss that at all. Um, I, mean I miss coming to London. I worked out it's been two years since I was in London and normally we make at least two trips a year. And that was hard. Um, and we're both theatre fanatics, and you know we haven't seen a show now for two years. Um, but we're going tomorrow night. So what are you going to see? Cinderella. It's my wife's birthday. It seemed appropriate. <laughs> I've, s I've been to six shows in the last three weeks, because I like going. And I read very interestingly that you're deeply involved with a particular theatre. I've been to six shows in the last two weeks. And if you're only here for a short time, Bernard, don't miss Anything Goes. I mean, it is quite, quite exceptional. I was in Anything Goes once. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, uh, this, you see, this is something that um, is, I find fascinating. Both of you have a very um, active interest and involvement in the mm. theatre. Um, and I know you perform, Bernard, or certainly before all this uh, happened. You, you have been a, a regular performer. Can you tell us a bit about how you got involved in it? By that? accident. Um, <laughs> We had a wonderful theatre in Chatham. Unfortunately, it's just been sold out from underneath us. Um, and every year, they would assemble drama students from all across North America to put on eight shows in 10 weeks. And 
the directors were always theatre professionals, either from London or New York. And because you don't want a 22-year-old playing King Lear, they would use equity actors, again, from London and New York. And they were allowed, under equity rules, to lo use local people to hold a spear. And I ended up playing Prospero there. Um, no wonderful part. That's quite a leap from holding a spear. Yeah, to I did to 38 shows in 10 oh, years. A hell of a part. But I'm going to get back to it next year because we're starting the Cape Cod Shakespeare Festival. Fantastic. So I, I know I'm in two of those plays. And can you give us a preview of who you're playing? Oh, I know. I'm playing Peter Quince in The Dream, which will be the third time I've played Peter Quince, and Sir Toby Belch in One. Twelfth Night, who has my favourite line in all Shakespeare. You stand there and do an obvious fart, and you say, a plague on these pickled herrings. <laughs> is a line I love delivering. That that'll sounds absolutely fantastic. Well, we all now we all know to book our tickets in advance. Um, and uh, Geoffrey, you've been very involved in theatre, in writing for well, theatre no, over the years. Well, no, at the moment I'm involved as a producer, which I hope Bernard would approve of. Uh, my son is a producer, and uh, I invest in shows he's in. He's in Back to the Future at the moment, and he's in the Lehman Trilogy at the moment. Uh, and I just love the theatre. I, I went to see Ian McKellen. You, you were talking about young people playing parts. I went to see Ian, Ian McKellen play Hamlet. And he's a year older than I am. And the, the very fact that he could remember the entire part at the age of 82 was staggering. Because I remember many, it just comes into my mind now, I remember many years ago meeting Michael Gambon and telling how much, how much I admired his Lear and why weren't we seeing him on the stage. And he said, and he must have been about 65, 66 then, he said, I can't remember the lines. And there is McKellen. And he's playing in Chekhov this week. If you missed, if you missed his Hamlet, he's playing in Chekhov this week. It's staggering, it's staggering. Well, so it's a, I mean, it's a, he's a fantastic example of somebody whose career has endured and, and in fact, you know, blossomed and gone on uh, over the decades, um, which is also true of both of you as writers. <laughs> um, here we are, you know, you're, you're, um, you've been writing for, is it 50 years, 40 years? 40, you, you started in the 80s. Years. Yeah, and, and you started in the 70s. Um, when you set out, when you started writing those first novels, uh, did you ever have any concept that they were going to be as popular and as successful as they were. Sixteen they people turned it yeah. down. I don't know how you did on your first book. I I'm sixteen. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> One turned it down. Only, oh. Um, <laughs> I had immense luck. I met a literary agent in New York and that is when it turned. Um, I was at a Thanksgiving Day party watching the Macy's Day Parade go beneath this balcony. And I remember the McDonald's American all, high, uh, all American high school band was high stepping past playing selections from Oklahoma. And a voice said in my ear, they do this sort of thing frightfully well, don't they? And I, being a brilliant conversationist, said, oh, you're English. Yes, he said. I said, what do you do? He said, I'm a literary agent. I said, well, I've just written a book. He went, fuck, <laughs> turn around <laughs> and walked away. So I followed him into the room and I said, I've had an offer on the book. He said, how much? He's getting slightly interested now. You can see like the fruit machine going. <laughs> and I said, 3,000 pounds world rights. Then he said, it must be a fucking awful novel and turned around and walked away again. <laughs> so I caught him a third time and was on my knees by now saying, would you please read my novel? I desperately need to get it published if I'm going to make a living over here. And he said, oh, well, dear boy, if you must, he said, meet me at the Oyster Bar at Grand Central Station tomorrow at midday. So I did, and we had a very awkward lunch. And he went away, and at 7 o'clock that night, he phoned me and said, how much do you want for this? And then that's how I met Susan and Harper Collins, and have been there ever since. I have one thing in common with you. My first book also sold for £3,000. <laughs> yes, relationships with editors and publishers um, are, you know, so essential to an author's career. And I, I think that that's something that, um, you know, perhaps when you started out, it was much more common to, to stay with the same editor and to have your career built over a number of books. Do, uh, I think that was the case for both of you, that, you know, the, the first books were not enormous hits straight away, but it was a, 
you had to build your career over uh, over several books. Does that has that changed now? Do you think for new authors starting out? I'm very conscious that that uh, if you don't make it fairly quickly nowadays, it's tough. I, I think 50 years ago they did let you do three books, maybe four. I'm not sure that rule still applies. So the houses were interested in building you and believing that there was a future because hitting it first time not only was rare but still is remarkably rare. And for you, was it, it, was it Cain and Abel that was the, yeah, the, third book the book that was the really third kind book. of yep. Um, yep. took I off? Uh, not a penny more, not a penny less. Sold 3,000 in hardback and 12,000 in softback. And was that the point when, when Cain and Abel became a big success? Was that the point where you thought, I, I, can, I can really do this, this is going to be, you know, my sort of main job yeah, I think from it now was on? The yeah. Yes, I think. But I, I, I've just recently met a lady who came to see me who had a massive contract. I couldn't believe the figure she'd been given for a two book deal. And the first book has been, they thought was wonderful and the public didn't. And they're not going to publish her second book. It's, it's Introduce cruel. her to Susan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty cruel out there. Do you remember, Bernard, the book for you that was the, the one that really took off where you thought, yes. It was yes, the fifth one. Yeah. Um, and I remember Susan telling me right at the beginning, it'll take five books. And she was right. I hate to admit she was right, <laughs> but she has been. Um, and for me, it really was desperation because I'd moved to America for love and couldn't get a green card. And the only job I could think of doing was to write books. And so if it hadn't happened, I don't know what I'd be doing. No idea. But I mean, to this day, I don't know if it's like this for Jeffrey. Every time I sit down to start a new book, I think I can't do this. It's too much. That's very reassuring to hear, actually, uh, because, you know, to see um, an author of your stature and experience, to say that that kind of the confidence still, you know, you still have to start again almost. From yeah, you do. With I mean, every book. book you start again. And I don't know. I mean, maybe now I sort of know I can do it because I've done it 59 times, I think. And so I assume that I can do it another time. But there's always that sort of scared moment at the beginning of a book. And the moment you write the first chapter, you're closing off options. You know, I mean, whatever the story is going to be, it's not going to be a whole lot of other things. It's very odd, but I still love doing it. Yeah, and you, but you must still love doing it, yep. presumably. Oh yeah, I think, I don't know about Bernard, but I'd pack up if I didn't still love doing it, if I didn't want to get up in the morning. Well, let's talk a bit about your, your writing process then, because obviously, you know, you've written, yeah, 59 books, 40-something books and plays, um, and uh, that doesn't happen by, I mean, that's not a sort of happy accident. The, the kind of success that you've both had is the result of talent, but also enormous discipline. And I know that you're both very, very disciplined with the way that you work. Um, can you tell us a bit about what a, a typical writing day looks like for you when you start out with a new book? It's extremely dull. I mean, I go to the office around seven in the morning and start work. And at least until two months ago, I'd break to walk the dog, but the dog died. Um, Oh, the book's de dedicated yeah. to the dog, yes. And I'm there till 5.30 at night, and every day. And of that time, how much is spent staring out of the window or banging your head on the I desk? I don't want to admit. Or <laughs> <laughs> um, quite a bit. But no, most of it is working. Yeah. And I absolutely refuse to believe in writer's block. Um, it doesn't exist, unless... I think you're allowed to have writer's block if you're just starting off and you think nobody will want to read this and it's, it's all too much. But um, I always claim that if a nurse at Cape Cod Hospital where I live was to phone up and say, I can't come to work today, I've got nurse's block, and they say, well, of course you mustn't. No, dear, you must stay there until you get over it. I mean, and her job is far more difficult than mine, far more. And nobody put a gun to my head and said, you will be a writer. Um, I volunteered and I love doing it. And even if you have a bad day, at least you know that the book's gone in the wrong direction, so throw that away and go back. Um, 
Yeah, and uh, Jeffrey, what's your um, because I know you go through many drafts of your books, and and you work in a very disciplined way as well. Well, I'm frightened. I don't know about you, Bernard. I'm frightened not to work in a disciplined way. So I work six to eight, ten to twelve, two to four, six to eight. I'd be fascinated to ask you how long you can concentrate, but I can't concentrate into the third hour. My mind begins to drift, so I, I now have a, and I have an egg timer, which is at one hour, which my wife gave me, and at, at the end of the hour I turn it over, because if you stop a quarter of an hour early in the two hours, four times a day, you've wasted an hour. Seven days a week, you've wasted seven hours. So it's there to tell me I must do the two hours, but frankly, at about two hours, ten minutes, I'm shattered, absolutely shattered. No, I don't feel, I don't, no, I don't time it like that. Um, <coughs> I don't know. I mean, I, my, one of my problems is I can never, never plot a book ahead. I mean, thank God HarperCollins has never asked me for a synopsis because I'd fail totally. And for me, the joy of writing a book is to find out what happens, um, which is the same joy as reading it. And I once got to the last chapter of an Uhtred book, and I honestly had no idea how it would end. Um, but it did end. And I like that feeling of the story revealing itself to you as you work. Um, and like Jeffrey, I do a lot of revisions, although I don't tend to do separate drafts. I tend to revise as I go along. Um, but it's fun. It really is fun. And I love it when, a, a, as you must know this too, that when a character decides they're going to make up their mind what they want and do it. And it, it's really weird, but nice. Yeah. No, well, I was thinking, it's interesting, you've both mentioned um, both of these books, there's a sort of uh, afterword or a Q&A. And you both talk about this idea of a, a character sort of pushing themselves to the fore or deciding that they are going to, you know, go in a different direction from what you might have anticipated. Is, is that something that you find? Do you plot in advance? Well, I remember a scene in, in the Clifton Chronicles where the wicked Virginia, uh, I've, I've decided that morning in bed that she is going in the witness box, that my brilliant QC will demolish her. She has no hope at all, and that will get rid of her once and for all. And picking up Bernard's point, I sat down at the desk, and she gets in. She's in beautifully dressed, and she goes in, and the jury are all staring at her, and that's fine. All right, I'm now going to kill you. So I have a, I thought it was a good question from the QC. She just bats it aside. <laughs> and I, you, I, good to see you laughing because you had the same problem. So I, I, I thought, oh, well, this is, so I wrote another one which would kill her. She batted it aside. And at the end, she had won and the QC had lost. But I didn't go back. I said, fine, we'll live with that and move on. So my heroine, Emma, had lost the whole case. And I hadn't meant to do that. And I think that can happen. So I pick up Bernard's much more important point. If you know where the book is going, the reader will know where the book is going. If you don't know where the book is going, there's no hope of the reader finding out where it's going. Do you, you mean in a good way? That, that it'll keep Wonderful them guessing? Way. Yeah. I, 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 I wrote a book called First Among Equals uh, 30 years ago when I had four characters who wanted to be prime minister. And picking up Bernard's point about that he had a book where uh, he didn't know what happened at the end, I, I'd got it down to two. I'd got it down to the conservative candidate and the Labour candidate and went to bed that night with two pages to write, not sure which one of them would become prime minister. Which one did? The Labour, Good. the Labour Party. <laughs> Tom Wilkinson. Okay. <laughs> got it. <laughs> yes, I decided that morning that he was the right man to be prime minister. <laughs> but it's interesting. I want to get, um, just come back to First Among Equals because I heard you say in a recent interview that if you were to write that book now, you wouldn't have four male characters. Correct. You would you would change Correct. that around. And I, I'm quite interested because you you both um, have written in in different ways about worlds that are quite male, and, and certainly, obviously, you know, 30, 40 years ago, politics, the, the world of politics was um, a lot more male dominated than it is now. Um, what are the challenges of, of writing female characters into those worlds? Well, after Cain and Abel, I wrote The Prodigal Daughter, the story of the first woman president of the United States. And here we are 40 years later, mm -hmm. and they still haven't had a woman president of the United States. And they think Trump and Biden must be better than any woman in the United States. It's just unbelievable. 
So no, I like strong women. I'm married to a strong woman. I had a very, the very great privilege of working for Margaret Thatcher for 11 years. My mother was a strong woman, so all my women in the books are what I call strong women. They're women who want to do real things. And even my wicked women, like Virginia, she knows where she's going. Of course, yeah. And um, but Bernard, you're writing about these worlds, you know, particularly with Sharp, or, or you know, and again with the um, the Saxon books. They, these are worlds of where warfare, you know, you're writing about warfare, very male dominated. How do you go about finding a place for for your female characters in that? Well, the, the strong male characters always want women to be around, so you know, you give it to them. And like Jeffrey, I do like a strong woman. I'm always annoyed that whenever there's a TV series or a film and a couple are running away, right, and they're being pursued by the evil villains, it's always the girl who trips over, right, and <laughs> the man has Good to go point. back. So in my books, it's n she doesn't trip. The man might trip, but she won't. Um, and I'd like to write strong female characters, because uh, Sharp likes them strong, too. And I, mean, I once thought of Sharp, he's actually not really frightened of very much. You know, you can face him with a battalion of the Imperial Guard and he'll find his way through them. But face with someone who looks like you and he's going to be terrified. <laughs> um, so, which I like about him. And actually, I, I have a lot of women readers and they seem to like that too. That they know they have power over Sharp. <laughs> and, but I, I like, never had to, I mean, I've never written a heroine. I've never written a book, so I'm not sure I could. I don't know if I can get inside. Women's heads are mysteries to me, so um, I, you have to see them through Sharp or through right. Rutrid. And it, let's, let's talk about Sharp, because you've had a long break from him. Fifteen years. And yeah, yeah, fifteen years, and um, his um, readers and, and fans will no doubt be absolutely thrilled and I'm sure people have been writing to you over the years saying you know when will he come back what prompted you to bring him back now and and how different does it feel writing about him after after 15 years away didn't feel different at all I mean he sprang back into my head exactly the same as he left it and in fact he never left it um, I mean I hear his voice I don't know if you do this I mean if I'm having a shower or walking the dog I hear the characters talking in my head about anything I mean it's not about the book and I would always hear Sharp, but it was always Sean Bean's voice, a wonderful Yorkshire voice. And, and uh, it was a pleasure. I mean, it's, it's always a pleasure to write Sharp, because I like his company. I don't know if he likes mine, but I like his. And uh, I think I'm going to do another Sharp now. And was the gap, was that just because you had so many other ideas for different her, things? Yes, or just that he'd, you'd sort of run out of, you needed to I wait to I mean, there were 21, how many do we yeah. need, you know? And, um, and I always wanted to write the story of the creation of England, which was Uhtred. Mm. Uh, so that took up most of those 15 years. And there were a couple of other books, Fools and Mortals. Um, but I always said to Judy, my wife, when I retire, I'm going to write another sharp. So I've just retired. Can, I ask, can yeah. I ask you, I apologise for no. doing your job. Did you, did you love the Waterloo period as a child, or did that come later? Did I? Love the Waterloo period, the whole... No, I loved it, yes. I as mean, a child or later? As a child. As a child. Thanks to Hornblower. Oh, really? And, I mean, Hornblower is really the genesis of Sharp. Mm. And way back when, I mean, I had a perfectly good career going with television and then was foolish enough to meet an American and fall in love. And she couldn't live in England for very good reasons. So I had to go to America. And I thought, well, you know, there's Forrester made a very good living off the Royal Navy. And then there was Belitho and Ramage and Dudley Pope and Alexander Kent doing the same thing. I don't think, don't think Jack Aubrey had been them. And I thought, well, why isn't someone doing it for the army? So that was really the idea, to do Hornblower on dry land. And I spent forever trying to find the right name for him, you know, Trumpet Whistler or <laughs> whatever. And I just couldn't find it. And so I named him after a famous rugby player, Richard Sharp. I just added an E to it. Um, and it stuck. I mean, once you put the name there, he couldn't be anybody no. else. I never have come up with a better name for him, so it'll be Richard Sharp forever. 
And uh, Jeffrey, when you were young, was there, was there a, a book or a series of books that kind of piqued your writerly um, instincts and made you think I would love to do something like this? No, I wanted to be a prime minister. <laughs> I, I was a Greater London councillor at 25. I was a member of parliament at 29, both far too young. No, I came to writing by mistake. I'm a weirdo in that sense. Uh, and uh, stuck with it, uh, as you said, after Ken and Abel and picking up your point on names. Susan will tell you that Ken and Abel was originally the brothers and then the protagonists. And then suddenly the name came. So I can believe Richard Sharp, who, by the way, when I was a schoolboy, was one of my heroes, one of the great rugby players. Well, he was for me too, yes. Yeah, captain of England, yeah. great player. And I was fascinated because the first thing I asked Bernard, when I met him this morning, was, is he named after the captain of England when I was a schoolboy? Uh, and yes, with an E. <laughs> yeah, I met him eventually. Um, actually, one of my favorite moments, and I don't, can't even remember which sharp book it is, but there was a game in South Africa where some gorilla playing for the South Africans was told to get rid of Sharp early in the game, and he managed to step on his ankle, and Sharp had to leave. And th th this man conveniently had a French-sounding name, so I made him a villain in one of the Sharp books. And before Sharp kills him, he breaks his ankle. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and you met the real. I Richard met the real Richard Sharp. Richard Sharp and yes. Was he honoured? He was charming. He was suffering horribly from, I think, rheumatism or arthritis by then, and so he was a shadow of his former self. But his daughter was doing very well in tennis. Um, was a sort of junior tennis champion. Um, that's all I remember about that meeting. Yeah, he, he seemed very happy to be immortalized as <laughs> an enemy of Napoleon's. Um, and it, you've mentioned Sean Bean, so let's, let's talk a little bit about um, adaptations and, and what it's like to see your work on the screen. Because uh, for you, um, Bernard, I think that the, the TV uh, incarnation of Sharp, again, that sort of changed the trajectory of the series, didn't it? Because that you then sort of went back and wrote... Yes, it provoked another yeah. 11 books. Yeah, um, and so when you say that you hear him now speaking in Sean Bean's voice, how, how did he sound? Is that different from how he sounded to you in the early books before there was a, a TV I think version? so, yes. I still see the original Sharp, who doesn't look anything like Sean. And I get vaguely annoyed when people write and say, how can he be... Sharp, he's got fair hair, and you say Sharp has got black hair, and you just want to write back and say, you know, live with it. <laughs> um, who cares? And, but I do hear Sean's voice, and Sean was a perfect Sharp, and he was absolutely perfect, um, and did it beautifully. I don't know, I mean, it's very odd. I mean, I see the Sharp series or the Last Kingdom, it's almost as if it doesn't belong to you any longer, um, it's somebody else's vision. But I think that's good because they add value. I mean, there's all those clever people, producers, directors, actors, technicians, makeup people, costume people, and they're bringing their skills to it. And it's all, it's just more and more creativity being piled onto it. And some readers get annoyed because they change the book, or change the story, but so what? As I said, you're just getting more for the price of one, you know, be glad of it. I mean, if I'm writing a sharp book and I'm beginning to think, oh God, this is getting a bit boring, I can wheel on 40,000 Frenchmen. <laughs> um, you know, it costs me nothing, but it costs the producers an awful lot, so they just <laughs> tend to wheel on an Elizabeth Hurley instead, <laughs> who has the same impression as 40,000 Frenchmen, I assure you. Um, and they did do that in one of them. Um, yeah. And they've got different constraints, so you know, I don't expect them to stick to the story. Um, and I love them. I mean, I love watching them. I can't wait for the next, indeed, last series of The Last Kingdom, which uh, we think starts early next year. And Judy and I just watch it like anybody else. We have no, and, but she d does occasionally say to me, why did they do that? I said, I don't know. I only wrote the books. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't a clue why he's doing that. Um, yeah. And Jeffrey, have, you, have you been, with your various adaptations over the years, have you been good at letting go of your story and, and seeing it as something different, or have you liked to get involved in, in productions? Well, I was very lucky because they cast very well for, uh, with Peter Strauss and Sam Neill. I got lucky to what I call truly professional actors. And I take Bernard's point that once you've released it, 
you've got to let it go. I accept that. Uh, I don't find it easy, but I accept that. And I also accept that if your man is five foot ten, fair haired, blue eyed, but the greatest actor available is dark haired and six foot one, you shouldn't complain. You should be very thankful indeed. In theory, in theory, because you must have been through this as well, Bernard. In theory, I've got a film starting in January. I'm going to say in theory 20 times so that you don't all, because, uh, but Doug Lynham's doing Paths of Glory in theory. And he's got, he's got uh, Ewan McGregor. Well, now, Ewan McGregor playing Mallory, I think is a brilliant choice. Mallory was a 1920, 1924 figure who wanted to conquer Everest, was at Cambridge, Magdalen College. Ewan McGregor will do that superbly. Uh, and I, I, if it happens, I, I'll be very lucky. But picking up Bernard's point about changes, I, I used to run a little when I was young. So I had a fascination in, um, in that same period, that same period, 1924. You've probably all seen Chariots of Fire. Well, I went with a dear friend of mine, my best man, who won a, a silver medal at the Olympics. And Bernard, they combined two, in Chariots of Fire, which I'm sure you all loved, they combined two Olympics into one and put two people running against each other who actually didn't run against each other. And we had supper afterwards, and we actually discussed whether it worried us. Because Lord, uh, Lord Exeter never, didn't run in the same Olympics as Harold Abrams. Uh, they were both at Cambridge. Uh, they were both at university at the same time, but they didn't actually run in the same Olympics. Now, no one ever discusses this. And Adrian, this is Adrian Metcalf, who was a great Olympic silver medalist, said, I, I don't care, really. I love the film. I absolutely love the film. Well, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I don't really care so much about the history. And you change the history. Um, and you get away with it by confessing your sins in a historical note at the end. And because I, rega I don't regard myself as an historian. I think I'm a storyteller. And the example I always use is um, Sharp's Company, which is one of my favorite Sharps. And it's about the siege of Badahoth, which was a dreadful, dreadful horror story. And the worst of the horror for the British were in the breaches. And there were three breaches. And they never got through. It was a, f a fake attack which was supposed to draw off defenders that worked. But the drama of the night was the breaches. And Sharp is going into the breach. And that means he has to get through. Um, so, you know, you change the history. The only times I really tried very ca carefully not to change the history is I wrote, wrote a book called Redcoat. And you realize that you're trespassing on the high ground of American myth, which is the revolution. Um, and so I took immense care not to change that history because it would upset the poor darling so much. It upset them anyway. But well, I was going to say, how do they, what, what was the response in the States to, well, to those Well, odd enough, quite generous. Um, I wrote another one called The Fort which was the biggest American naval disaster until Pearl Harbor, when they sent 42 ships against three British ships, three small British ships, and they lost all 42. Um, I mean, it was just sheer incompetence. And that was fun to write. Um, but <laughs> that went down less well. Mm. <laughs> well, I think it went down well here. <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting um, because so another thing I wanted to ask both of you, I think, is that um, you're both writing about uh, particular kinds of Englishness. I mean, obviously, for you, you're writing it largely, ap apart from the American books, largely about English history and certainly with the Last Kingdom books about the kind of foundation mm. of England and English identity. A and Geoffrey, you've written a lot about the, the British establishment. Um, and what it's like to be inside the corridors of power. Um, and yet your books are enormously successful all over the world. What, what do you think is the appeal of that kind of English identity or that, that sense of English identity? Well, I'd like to think it's the story. Simple as that. Mm. I mean, you tell a story, people want to read the story. They want to know what, what happens. Um, I mean, that's the only answer I could possibly give. If they have any appeal, it's surely the story. And although there is a mad French publisher, 
um, who began publishing the Sharp books in France. It would have been easier just to throw money off the <laughs> Pond Murph. Um, and I did get a darling little 14-year-old Parisian girl who fell madly in love with Sharp and would write to me. And I'd always write back saying, look, you're in love with the wrong man. <laughs> <laughs> um, but because eventually Sharp himself falls in love with a French woman, which surprised me. I never expected that. And um, I don't think the Sharp books were ever that successful in France, which is sad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I'd like to think it's story. Yeah. I, I actually think story trumps everything. I totally agree with Bernard that uh, it's first. And, and I always worry that I'm so old fashioned and my stories are so British that they will fail. And yet uh, my biggest sales in the world are in India. So they're clearly more British than the British still. And I can see pockets where they're more British than the British. And uh, I, I agree totally with that. In the end, they want a good story. And if you look back through history, why is the Count of Monte Cristo still read? It's still read because it's a damn good story. And you can go through all the great books in history and come to Dickens and all his amazing books. Give them a good story. They won't care which country it's set in. And where does a good story begin for you? When, you, when, you, when an idea sort of first starts to germinate, is it characters? Is it a particular setting? Is it perhaps a, an anecdote that you've overheard or picked up from the news? Um, you know, where, where does the, the germ of a story begin for you and how do you know that it's going to have legs? I was going to ask you the same question. <laughs> um, I think the first line is very important. So that you, I try very hard in the first line to indicate something. Uh, Cain and Abel, um, I spent hours on just the first line. Uh, she only stopped screaming when she died. It was then that he started to scream. And sometimes I think with writing, one word can switch the whole sentence, can change the whole feel of where it's going but I knew where I wanted to go after that line. So I think beginnings are very important. There's a very great English writer who shall be nameless. He can't end a book. He's probably a, our greatest writer. Bernard and I quite rightly tell you we're storytellers, but arguably the greatest writer in this country at the moment, who I can't resist. I have to read every, wor every word, every sentence. You can't finish a book. We're all he, he, frantically no. trying to guess who it is. Yeah. Well, you'll know, you'll know if you, you all read him. You know that he can't finish a book. So I think the old Kipling saying, you have to have a beginning, you have to have a middle, and you have to have an end, is a cliche, but it's a, an accurate cliche. Mm. What about you? I was going to say, because I'm writing about a real character, I sort of shape the series according to where he was in any given year and then and then find a story that will fit around around that and around that background research um and i wondered if that's how you d is that how you wait go about wait it a minute, wait a minute wait a minute and you switch from england to france suddenly and put my man in france and in trouble i, I mean I yeah love because he he did he left england and he went back to france because he, had he, to. he was yeah so i try to follow the history in that sense i mean i agree with bernard about the importance of the you know, d tweaking things if it suits the drama better. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> you know, because if you are going to follow the history absolutely faithfully, then um, you might as well write a biography. But uh, but I do sort of try to stay faithful to more or less where we know the character of Bruno was um, in any given year. So that's why he ended up in France, and he's going to Prague next. Um, he has the saddest love life I've ever come across. Well, apart from Sharp, d had generally had a, a fairly... Um, <laughs> I remember hearing you say once that when you went back and did the, uh, the earlier books, because mm. you'd sort of started at one point and then you had to go back and do prequels, yes. that then you couldn't ever have him have a lasting relationship because... No, the women the all women die. It's very in sad. The, in in one of my favourite heroines is Lady Grace in Sharp's Trafalgar, but because she's not mentioned in the subsequent books, which were written ten years before, she has to die. Yeah. 
which is sad. Gosh, um, I never thought of that. So, I mean, that second series of 11 books is just a lot of dead women. Yes. Which is awful. <laughs> Constantly. He has a, a is she based on Lady Hamilton? No. No. No, definitely not. Definitely and not. And so for you, Bernard, what, what makes a good story for you, or where does the story begin? Um, well, I usually begin it by throwing the hero, and it's always a hero, into a situation to see how he gets out, um, because I don't know where it's going. Um, that wasn't true of Sharp's assassin, and I quite like the first line. There were three men on the ridge, two of whom were alive. Oh, that's um, a very good line. And but then I knew, th I knew Assassin had to begin the morning after Waterloo, and that's a nice situation to be in. Well, it wasn't. It was a horrible situation to be in. But um, So I really broke the rule, which is not to have something dramatic happening in the first chapter. Uh, I always think of, it was P.G. Woodhouse, another writer who worked in America, another Englishman. I mean, C.S. Forrest to P.G. Woodhouse, there's a long tradition of them. And whenever he finished a page, it was always off the typewriter, he would take the page and he would pin it to the wall. And if it was a, he was entirely happy with it, it went at the top. If he thought it was rubbish, it went at the bottom and it was somewhere in between. And then when he'd finished his first draft, he looked around and said, all right, all those pages at the bottom, they need to be worked on first. Um, and I think, I don't do anything quite as daft as that, uh, but I do, you're always conscious all the time, am I boring the reader? Um, and that's the sin of sins. And you try very hard not to bore the reader. <laughs> I'm sure and you do as well. Well, yeah, and I do think, and I think, yes, I, you, you start to get a sense, don't you, of whether, as you're writing something, of whether it's, um, I mean, if it's engaging you in the yes, writing of it. Yes, it has to engage you yeah. first. And I always say to people, you write for yourself first. And I assume you write the sort of books you want to read, which is rather a damning comment on me, I think. But <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I think there's a... I wanted to ask you both about the idea of genre, because there's still, I think, um, although things are um, shifting in recent years, but there's still a lot of snobbery around the idea of writing fiction that is commercially successful or fiction that is in a... In this country. In a particular... In this country, certainly. Um, and, I mean, you're now writing uh, what are effectively crime novels, mm -hmm. although you you don't call them crime novels, no, no. Um, and you write adventure stories. Exactly, and and yeah. uh, I wonder whether the idea of, of genre, do you, I mean, do you find that sort of confining or do you never think in those terms? Do you always just think about the story that you're going to tell? No, I mean, I know I'm a, a genre writer and I, I, it's fine. I mean, remember what Samuel Johnson said, only a blockhead doesn't write for money. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Sharp has given Judy and I a very nice life. Uh, well, and given readers an enormous amount of pleasure. Yeah, as I well. mean, I That's regard myself as part of the entertainment industry. We're, you know, you write the books to entertain people. Um, and if that's being a genre writer, then, uh, you know, good, I like it. Jeffrey, I mean, you've, you've done extremely well out of your books. Has it ever bothered you, the idea that you're considered a commercial writer or that that's in any I think way... A I go back and say what I said at the beginning. I think it's very British, you know. Mm. They don't treat you that way in America. Uh, or I'm sure they don't treat you that way. You, you know much more about America than I do. And, uh, and they don't, funnily enough, treat me that way in France or Germany. It's in this country where Guardian writers Say, well, do you know, he's, uh, yes, he's a good storyteller, but uh, you know he's a, uh, well, yes, he's a good st I hate that. And I was trying desperately when you were talking to Bennett to think of someone. I mean, do we really believe that Conan Doyle was a great writer? No. He was a brilliant, brilliant storyteller. And when I was at Oxford, I've never forgotten uh, the professor of English literature saying that Dickens was not a great writer. He was sort of a middling as a writer. And there was no question he was a great storyteller. And on storytelling, this comes into the mind, so I'm bound to say it, having, having just been to see Hamlet, I'd forgotten. Yes, he was the greatest writer this country has ever produced. Yes, he was the greatest poet this country has ever produced. But I want you all to think for a moment, if you'd never seen Romeo and Juliet, you would be desperate to know the ending. All of you in this room know the ending. And I sat thinking, 
He's also the greatest storyteller of them all. Look at old Toby Belch. I mean, what a... And, and, and but he stole his stories, he, God yeah, bless oh, him. <laughs> yes, you know. well, yes, this is another discussion. Look at Toby Belch and look at Wall and look at the Quince and look at... Yes. I mean, that whole... Isn't that wonderful? And it's a subplot within the story, and yet it's wonderful. Well, and you, you've written, of, you mentioned earlier, Fools and Mortals, um, set in Shakespeare's theatre. Uh, have you always been fascinated with it? That's a book that I'm very fond of among, among yours, um, obviously, because of the... No, the it wasn't really. I mean, it was being part of this theatre in Cape Cod, um, and watching them put a Shakespeare play together. And I thought it's probably not that different from what happened at the theater, the first of his theaters, which was called the theater before the globe. Um, and that's where that began. It was just an absolute fascination. And then I began to read everything I could about Tudor theater. Um, so it really was, it's a love letter to the theater, that book. Um, and really the story of that book, although there is a, a plot of sorts, it's about how you put on a play in the year 1595 and the process of it. Um, Do you think you'll return to that world? No, I don't, because oh. I think that <laughs> if I was to do another one, uh, it would be the same idea of how do we put, you know, how do we put as you like it? How do you get it from the written page to the stage? Which is a lovely process, but I've done it once, and I think probably it's best left. I, li I mean, I actually did think originally that we could do Richard Shakespeare the unknown brother, and who really did exist. Um, I have a few books, but I don't think, it's, I don't think it can be done. Not by me, someone mm. else can do it. Um, well, I just wanted to ask both of you then, uh, in terms of, um, well, with these recent books, but, um, but also just over the, the course of your um, recent novels, how will you go about researching, I mean, you mentioned they're reading everything that you could get your hands on about Tudor theatre, and you've obviously done um, a vast amount of um, research for the Sharp books in, in that period. How do you start researching when it's something that you're coming to fresh, or, or even when it's something that you haven't been writing about for a while? Well, you obviously do read everything there is. I mean, you know, and you visit the places. That, I think, yeah. I mean, that was what I missed during COVID. Because although I'd been to Paris a few times, I'd never sort of walked the Rue de Montreuil, which I needed to know. Luckily, I had a friend who lives in Paris, and I would email him and say, walk up Rue de Montreuil, look to your left, tell me what you see. And he did all this for me. Um, I think that's it. I mean, it's immense reading. And it was just sad that Wellington never had a campaign in Tahiti, but... <laughs> <you know. laughs> yes, I, know, I have that, that problem. <laughs> yeah. And, and well Jeff, I know you've got... In my case, yeah. I got lucky. I was at an Advent carol service for the Lords and the Commons, which is held once a year. And one of the people who read was a former, very young man, 45 years old, former chief superintendent who'd headed the murder squad and there was a tiny paragraph about him and I had a chat to him afterwards and he'd left the Metropolitan Police with what he describes in his own book very movingly as one murder too many he had a mental breakdown and he left the police I did some research and found that he was tipped after uh, a career at Oxford and then going into the police he was tipped to be the commissioner but he had this mental breakdown. So I went to see him and said, I, I, I want to write about a guy called William Warwick who leaves school and goes into the Metropolitan Police. I want to take him from constable through to commissioner. You seem to be ideal. And he said, no, I can't, I can't do it. He said, I haven't recovered. Well, I was in the middle of something else at that time, so I waited a year and went back to him. And what he does, he reads, about, he reads about the fourth draft and corrects all the mistakes. And then occasionally, if you're very lucky, he'll give you a line, he'll give you something that you know you have to have been in the police force for 30 years before you would get that line. And I, I remembered, I said to him once, um, 
kind of tricky, you know, were you coming down from Oxford and your sister was already teaching at Somerville? They must have thought you were very strange walking in to the local Nick. And did they tease you? He said, oh, yes. And he said, did you handle that? He said, but the best one was, uh, he said, I came in one morning, I, I was a young constable, and the desk sergeant said, uh, he said, Sutherland, we've got a problem in cell three. Go and get this prescription immediately. Go straight down to Boots. Get this prescription immediately. So I ran off to Boots, very determined, and there was a queue at the counter. So I rushed to the front and I apologized to everybody. And I said, sorry, this has to be done immediately. And the lady behind the counter read it, and then she turned around and took a packet of condoms off the shelf and handed the condoms to my man. And my man went red as a beetroot, <laughs> walked out, read the thing, and he said, I'm a young constable, and I've met this girl, and I think I might be in with a chance. What do you recommend? <laughs> <laughs> now, you couldn't make that up. He had, that had to have happened to him. And so I'm always searching for, uh, I'm always searching for little side. And my other researcher, uh, Detective Sergeant Michelle Roycroft, she left the force two years ago after 30 years in the drug squad. Oh, the things she can tell you that, uh, and they make, I mean, I'll just sit her down for lunch and say, tell me about that one. When she dived through the top of a roof with two six foot, drug dealers in there. I mean, I would run the other way. So I've got these two who can give me authenticity. Yeah. Though I agree with Bernard as well, you've got to visit the places. You've got to have gone to where it is and where it's happening. So all of that as well. But I love talking to people who are experts in their field. So when I, when I wrote uh, Paths of Glory, I went to see Chris Bonington and I went to see Bear Grylls. And I said to Chris Bonington, can you tell me, do you think Mallory managed the last 700 foot? Because of course, his body was found 700 foot from the top. Was he on the way up or was he on the way down? So the great man said, uh, what does it matter? I said, I beg your pardon. He said, what does it matter? He was in hobnail boots, a three piece suit, and he didn't know where he was going. Nowadays, there are signposts all the way up to the top. This was the greatest climber that ever lived. And in the case of Bear Grylls, I sat him down and said, now his father and I had been in the House of Commons together, so I'd known him since he was this height. I sat him down and said, because oh, he did it. I sat him down and said, I'm 700 foot from the top bear. Talk, what happened in the last 700 foot? Take me through it. So he talked me through going that last 700 foot until he reached the top and how he got back down. And that's when I discovered, not knowing, that coming back down is more difficult than going up. And so I, I agree with going to places, but I love to talk to people who've had amazing experiences. Well, I think um, we're going to have to wrap up there. Thank you both so much Thank for, you, um, for sharing so, uh, so much of your expertise. Um, these two wonderful books are out now. Um, you can order those. And you're both going to be doing more publicity and more talks and travelling around. Is that something that you enjoy, going out and meeting readers? And, uh, I do, actually, yeah. yes. yes. Yeah. And well, he's, he's a, he's a, a monke out-of-work actor. <laughs> <laughs> and so am I. So yes, yes. So well, yes is the answer. Perhaps now that the theatres are reopening, maybe, yes, we'll maybe be you'll back. both um, be cast in, in uh, something. Well, thank you again for, um, for your conversation. Uh, thank you both for joining thank us. You. Jeffrey Archer, Bernard Cornwall. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you for being here. Thank you.